In this video, we're taking a close look at the new Flash Forge Adventurer 4 3D printer. We'll run down the specs, compare it to the Adventurer 3, and run it through its paces, showing you how it performs and what to expect, so stick around. The Flash Forge Adventurer 4, building on the capabilities of the Adventurer 3, They've made lots of improvements across the board, so let's dive in. Enclosure-wise, don't be fooled. Although it looks identical, the Adventurer 4 has grown significantly in size. And with external dimensions of 20 inches by 22 by 20, this machine will take a nice chunk of your desktop real estate. Around the enclosure, maintaining its minimalist design, on the front side has a build chamber access door with a magnetic latch. To the right of it is the Adventurer 4 badge with a 4-inch touchscreen and USB port. On the right side of the machine, we have a filament access door, which allows for a full one kilogram spool of filament. This also has a magnetic latch. There's also an RJ45 network socket and a standard IEC three pin power connector and an on off power switch. On the rear of the machine, there's a standard model and serial number sticker. And on the left side, there's a viewport into the build chamber. On the top, there's an additional viewport into the build chamber, along with ventilation on the top rear edge of the enclosure. Inside the enclosure, we have an inverted Cartesian gantry with dual 12 millimeter vertical linear rails and dual six millimeter horizontal rails, a six millimeter belt on the X axis and dual six millimeter lead screws on the Z axis. The modular hot end supports the same quick release J head nozzles, which is a modified Bowden extruder, which means the filaments push through the tube to the hot end. While these hot ends are great, as a result, you won't be able to use soft or flexible filaments with this printer. The stock nozzle is a 0.4 millimeter tip with a range of up to 240 degrees Celsius. These nozzles work well and get to temperature in around 60 seconds or less. Additional nozzles can be purchased from 0.3 millimeter to 0.6 millimeter and up to 265 degrees Celsius, which is required to print its more advanced filaments such as polycarbonate or PETG. The print head receives its power through a flat flexible cable or FFC connected to the sidewall of the build chamber. There is a chamber ventilation fan in the top rear of the build area, which can be controlled by the slicer's advanced settings. The large enclosure brings a significant build volume of nine by eight by 10 inches, almost 150% of the original build volume on the Adventurer 3. The build area has a magnetic removable build plate, which has a coating similar to the Adventurer 3, only this time on what appears to be spring steel, which allows you to flex the plate to remove stubborn prints from the build plate. The bed has a solid 8mm aluminum heat plate which prevents platform irregularities from causing poor bed adhesion. As all the build leveling is done by the processor, there's no physical way to adjust the bed height. Running a quick test on the flatness of the bed confirmed that it's within 0.01mm of flatness, which is pretty good. The build plate, which has the surface fill of masking tape, is magnetically held with strong force to the bed. It has three insulated handles on the sides and front to prevent burns when picking up the bed when it's hot. That said, the heated bed can reach 110 degrees Celsius, which will help with tough filament bed adhesion, like ABS and polycarbonate. While the chamber is enclosed, it's not sealed. There are cracks in the doors, which may cause a draft when the chamber ventilation is enabled. And if you print hard filaments in a cool environment, cool drafts may cause issues with warping, adhesion, layer delamination. So keep that in mind when slicing. On the right side of the build chamber, there's a camera, which doesn't seem like the best location, but it will capture images and time lapse of your prints. Closing the chamber, we look at the front touchscreen menu system. When the machine is powered up, we get the flash forward splash screen and then the loud ready beep sequence, which can be disabled in the settings. The main screen has status indicators across the top to determine when certain features are enabled like wireless connectivity, camera capture, and whether a USB dongle is present and others. Below that is the menu system organized into four categories, build, prepare, settings, and maintain. Clicking into the build menu item asks you to select local files or a USB device. Selecting local displays files that have been copied to the machine or sent over to the machine via Wi-Fi. Selecting the file allows you to immediately print that object. Similarly, selecting USB device will allow you to print files located on an inserted thumb drive. As we'll see later, files can be printed remotely on the machine as well. Back at the main menu, clicking into the prepare menu item allows you to preheat the extruder or platform. You can manage the print filament by loading a new spool, changing an existing filament, or manual control over the entire filament change process. Clicking into the settings menu item exposes a large list of machine settings. It covers everything from moving the extruder gantry to connecting to Wi-Fi, LAN, or cloud services. 
Flash Cloud is a FlashForge online slicing and print management platform. They also support integration with Polar Cloud, which is another platform popular in education and maker communities. Both offer free accounts. The printer also provides a hotspot for connecting directly to it without a network. Next, we have the ability to manage the default chamber fan speed. This is the air exhaust fan located in the print chamber, not the extruder fan. Status will show the current machine status, including extruder, bed temps, and whether or not a filament's loaded. There is filament detection such that if your filament runs out or you lose power, you are able to resume your prints after reloading additional filament or regaining power to the machine. You can change the brightness of the LCD display, which seems a little backwards to me. One is the brightest and three is dim. Okay. If English is your second language, the machine supports seven additional languages to help you out there. For me, no hablo otro idiomas. I don't speak other languages. <laughs> you can also disable the camera, enable automatic time-lapse videos, or take a photograph. Clicking on pictures displays a simple file manager, which allows you to look at the photos that have been taken, and any time-lapse videos that has, have also been compiled by the machine. You can copy these to a thumb drive, or you can delete them directly on the machine. You can also toggle extruder lighting. There's a couple lights above the extruder, but there is no chamber lighting in this machine. Paging to the next tab of settings, you can toggle filament detection. This machine has print recovery features that also allow you to resume a print if the machine loses power or runs out of filament, which is a nice feature. I'm not sure why you disable it. And you can also toggle the audible machine beeps. Here you can also change the name of the printer. You can also look at the machine about specs, which will let you know the firmware version, the MAC address, serial number, and a lot more. Finally, you can perform a factory reset and restore the machine to its default settings. Back on the main screen, clicking into the maintain menu item allows you to upgrade the machine to the latest version of the firmware. You can copy machine log files to a USB drive, calibrate the extruder and build platform. This walks you through a bed probing process to capture the bed heights at up to nine specific locations on the bed. Once that's been performed, the machine will automatically compensate for the offsets to ensure a great first layer on your prints. Alternatively, toggling expert mode will disable this feature. Next, you can walk through the replacement of the extruder, which is swappable for larger nozzles and higher temperature extruders. These are compatible with the Adventurer 3 nozzles and available at the FlashForge website. Finally, a maintain item shares frequently asked questions to explain steps and troubleshoot any issues that you may encounter with the machine, which is a nice touch. It saves you from having to Google or go to their website to find out how to do these things. Now back out to the main screen, that's the machine. Now let's get something printed. And to do that, we need to slice some models. Now, depending on your level of expertise, you have a few options ranging from open source to retail or writing your own G code. While there are benefits of each of these strategies, to get up and running quickly, I recommend using one of the FlashForge slicers. They both support Adventure 4. The first is FlashCloud, an internet-based 3D printing management and social platform. You can register and connect your printers there, manage your print jobs, and even check the status of a print job. You have the option to upload your own models or browse a collection of user contributed 3D files. Selecting a model allows you to print them directly from the web page, whether you upload it or you find it in the library. With a few simple selections, the cloud will slice and print the file directly to your machine. While this is the easiest method that does not require any installation, you'll have limited control over the slicer parameters and that may be useful on some more complex prints. Alternatively, you can install FlashPrint, FlashForge's fully capable slicer. Once installed, you can connect it to your FlashForge printer and then set up your model specific to your needs. With factory installed printer profiles, you don't have to worry about the complexities unless you want to. Then of course you can access just about all the settings and slicer parameters to tune it exactly how you need it. These files are sliced and then sent over to the machine either over local, wireless, or sneaker net using a thumb drive. So to prepare for printing, I sliced a bunch of models ranging from simple to complex to mechanical to test many aspects of the machine's performance, accuracy, and extrusion consistency. While the machine comes with a one kilogram spool of white PLA, I used a couple different filament types, including black PLA, black ABS, silver silk, and black silk. Starting with a couple black PLA low poly Pokemon models by Flotastic, the models printed well. They were printed at 0.2 millimeter layer height with a 20% infill and they came out clean and nice. Next, I printed one of my Arcator subframes with the same settings, clean layers, tight tolerances, no over extrusion, and the support layers were moved pretty easily. Switching over to ABS, I printed a large Darth Vader bust by Eastman. This took over 30 hours to print and at first glance, it looks pretty good but there were some issues with layer delamination. Now, while this printer has an enclosed chamber, it's not perfectly sealed. 
And as there are lots of gaps around the doors, the drafts seem to get in. While my shop is air conditioned, at night I turn it off, and during this particular time that it was printed, we had a, quite a heat streak going of 95 degrees during the day, 76 at night. As a result, the layer delamination happened about every eight hours or so, which is roughly coincides with the AC schedule. Now there are a few things that you could do to fix this, like raising the extruder temperature or increasing the extrusion percentage to ensure good layer adhesion. The easiest solution may have been just to keep the room at the same temperature over the course of the print. So short of running it again, root cause is undetermined while ABS is notorious for warping and these sort of layer delaminations. Printing the same model at a reduced size in silk PLA turned out great. I also used some of the silk PLA to print a bust of good old Walt Disney by Barry1685. This printed good, of course, had great layers, no over extrusion or retraction issues, really nice quality in general. Finally, to test the dimensional accuracy, I printed the Flying Turtle Assembly by Amao Chan. Now these parts are a little more intricate. And the mechanical assembly is critically dependent on the dimensional accuracy and extrusion precision to create these hinged parts, gears, components that all work well together. I printed them in black PLA with a raft at 0.15 millimeter layer height and 40% infill. The Adventure 4 printed them with ease, no major exceptions, they all peeled easily off of the raft and after assembly, the final assembly works like a charm. I'll put links to all the models used in this video in the description for you to check out. All in all, I had a positive experience with printing just about everything I did, with the exception of the large Darth Vader bust, which can still be used but will require some work to iron out all the issues with printing ABS at that size. The default slicer settings were exceptionally tuned for pretty good results, but they could certainly be tuned to strengthen the models for specific functional requirements like infill and extrusion percentage, and then again, I need to do that with every printer I use. It's always important to consider the mechanical and thermal properties of the filament type being used as they directly correlate to the settings required to get the print dialed in to your specs. I didn't have any issues with the printer to speak of. The magnetic platform works great and it's a nice feature to remove prints so long as the bed's not hyperextended to introduce a bend in the metal, and then all bets would be off. My favorite feature of the design of the machine is how reliable the extruders are, how self-contained it is, how simple it is to swap out, and they don't seem to have any clogging issues that I've had with many of the other printers I've used. The wizard-driven features of the printer's interface make it easy to use and manage, with only a few minor grammars and translations. As this comes to market, I'd expect the documentation to become available, as it would be useful to have a quick start guide like they've provided for the Adventure 3, which for new users can prevent a lot of headaches in getting started. I'm happy with the design and performance of the machine and would recommend it to people that want a well-designed 3D printer solution that's easy to use, manage, and maintain, while providing you pretty good capabilities to grow into. I'll put links in the description where you can find more information about the printer and its resources. Hopefully you enjoyed this quick look at the FlashForge Adventurer 4 3D printer. I believe they're currently selling them with an anticipated shipment at the end of July, so if you're interested in something like this, go check it out, get in queue. Thanks for hanging around. If you'd like to support the channel, there are lots of ways you can do that. For starters, if you like this particular video, give it a big thumbs up. It lets me know you care. And that's kind of how this platform works. Subscribe to the channel, ring that notification bell, it'll keep you in the loop on future updates. Leave a comment if you have a question about the printer. And lastly, you can support the channel by backing me on Patreon, like these wonderful people. Or check out DIY.engineering website, there's lots of fun stuff over there. I've got some fancy new projects coming up with electronics and CNC work, as well as some machine giveaways, so be sure to come back for those. In the meantime, be safe, have fun, and I'll see you next time. Hey, if you liked the video, please subscribe to the channel. It's how we're building the community. Also, allow me to bring better content. Also, check me out on these other social networks. There's lots of cool stuff there, too. See ya.